Good evening and welcome to episode eight of Down on the Corner, the flagship show of KindnessCorner.com. I'm your host, Mark Roseman. Tonight, my co-host is KindnessCorner.com's Russ Cohn. Joining us tonight is the director of broadcasting and media relations, as well as the voice of the Syracuse Mets, Michael Tricarico. So welcome, Michael. And, and on the team bus, you got to love that. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me, guys. Hopefully the uh, connection here is is all right. If it's not what we know, but uh, it's kind of what we deal with here on the on the road in the, in the minor leagues. But uh, we're we're happy to be uh, rolling. Hey, with awesome. Um, before we talk about the Syracuse Mets, let's talk a bit about your career. Um, you knew early on you had a passion for sports broadcasting. In fact, you would pretend to broadcast basketball and football games that were on television pretty much as young as five years old. So who were some of the early influences on you and what made it so appealing to you as such a young kid? Yeah, it's, it's funny, um, you know, when I'm, I'm asked that question, there, I, I can't say there's any, any specific broadcasters growing up that, you know, were really uh, the ones that got me into it. And it really just started as something I, I liked to do. I didn't even know it was, uh, obviously I watched, I watched sports, I played sports growing up, but it wasn't something that, uh, in terms of broadcasting, I even thought of it as a career. It was just something I liked to do whenever I, um, you know, played. Whenever I played video games uh, growing up, would just you know talk about myself playing them, or be out in the backyard and be, uh, you know, doing play by play of myself playing basketball. And the same thing with you know football and basketball games that were were on TV. So I, I can't say there were necessarily any uh, you know specific broadcasters that I listened to. I can't be like, oh, I listened to Vince Scully growing up and wanted to be just like him or anything like that, but. Um, you know, it was just one of those things that I enjoy doing. And, and then it was, you know, closer to, to middle school and, and high school where, you know, I got involved in the, the television studio at, at my middle school and, you know, found out that, hey, maybe this is a, a career that I can go into and thought about going into, you know, being a sports center anchor and then, you know, found out about some play by play opportunities and, and realized that, okay, maybe this is for me considering I have been doing it pretty much my whole life. So obviously Syracuse University has become synonymous with sports broadcasting. Marv Albert, Len Berman, Bob Costas, Ian Eagle, Marty Glickman, Adam Shine, Steve Gelbs, yourself, just to name a few. What makes their communications department so special where it literally is a factory for some of the biggest names in sports journalism? Yeah, it really comes down to the extracurricular opportunities uh, that Syracuse has to offer. You know, Newhouse is an awesome school and, you know, you have some great professors, but it really comes down to taking advantage of, you know, Syracuse being a <coughs> Division I uh, university and a, a Power Five conference and, and taking advantage of opportunities at the radio stations that are there. There's actually uh, three of them on campus, but the two main ones are uh, WAER, which is the NPR affiliate on campus, and that's the that's the main one that, you know, like to Rico and Sean McDonough, and Bob Costas all, all got involved in during their time at, at Syracuse. And, and it's an opportunity where, you know, it's a professionally run station, but the, the sports department is all student run. So, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, able to take advantage of, you know, my four years there and, and was the sports director uh, at the end of my junior year and into my senior year. And, you know, we got the opportunity to call Syracuse football, men's basketball, men's lacrosse games. Uh, and we, you know, travel on the road to, to all of those games, covering them, doing play by play. So you're, you're essentially covering, you know, uh, high level division one athletics and, and just getting those, those opportunities, um, you know, is something special. And, you know, nowadays, most universities offer that. I think the one thing that really separates Syracuse from everywhere else is you know, the feedback you get, um, not just from professors and, and teachers and, uh, you know, and the ability to talk to alums as well, but honestly, the feedback you get uh, from, from your peers. I think uh, just how the system is set up where you know, when you're a freshman or sophomore, you're paired up with a junior or senior who has already gone through that process. And really things are just passed down from, you know, one generation of, uh, of, of students to the next. And I think that's what really makes it special, but it's, you know, the, the school itself, but those extracurricular opportunities at the, the radio station and the television station on campus that, that really makes it, uh, you know, different from, from other places. So it's interesting because we look at the minor leagues as the ladder ball players must climb to make it to the majors. Um, you've done collegiate league baseball, Cape Cod, uh, the Fort Wayne Tin Caps, which is a high A minor league team, now triple A. 
So just as players need to adjust and make minor adjustments along the way, I assume you have to do that as well, you know, um, moving up the ladder. So could you uh, tell us what, you know, you had to adjust to along the way? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's one of those things where just like, uh, you know, and, and I think minor league baseball and, and baseball in general is, is unique in that aspect where there's pretty much everyone who's working in baseball is trying to work their way up to the major leagues at, at one point or another from the, the coaching staff to the, the players, of course, the umpires, uh, and, and of course, the broadcasters, too. So I think you have to adjust mm -hmm. to different levels. You, you have to learn a lot from uh, you. I, I'll, I'll learn a lot from not just the other broadcasters that I've gotten the opportunity to work with, but from the players and coaches themselves, getting the opportunity to, uh, you know, interview these guys and learn from them. And, uh, you know, you cultivate a really special relationship with the players and coaches. So, you know, adjusting from, from one season to the next, from one group to the next. And I've been really fortunate to be a part of uh, some really great organizations of, of uh, people who, really appreciate the broadcasting side of things uh you know the, the Syracuse Mets are uh, certainly special in that respect uh, just in, in terms of some of the lineage of broadcast also the baseball team here and I've gotten the opportunity to learn from many of those and, and stayed in touch with many of those broadcasters and you know now to adjust to uh you know the the, the new uh players and coaches you get from one year to the next i've been fortunate to have just a, a great group of us to be able to work with where you know it, it makes it uh just an, an, an easy year so you mentioned it about the interviews as well you do play-by-play -play for the circus mats you interview the players coaches for pre-game radio segments you create the game notes of daily media packets statistics and all the information right post-game stories um, as well as the monthly program book. So you are actually the perfect person to speak to uh, about the next wave of New York Met players. Let's start with the two prominent names that have already joined the team this year. Mm -hmm. Batty is slowly but surely making the transition, while Alvarez uh, homered yesterday. He's having some issues handling Major League pitching. You've seen them both. Tell us what are some of the things both of them need to work on, in your opinion, um, at this level and which of the two do you think is better acclimated to be in the majors right now and why? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, to start with the, the biggest adjustment is just getting used to the pitching up there. Uh, you know, I, I remember when Alvarez got here to uh, Syracuse last season, uh, you know, I, I remember some of the conversations he was having for the, the former manager that we had here, Kevin Bowles, and, you know, that they were talking about how, uh, you know, when you're in double A, uh, some of the pitches you you know if a pitcher falls behind an account two and oh you 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 could at least make it a decent bet that you're gonna you might get a you know, a fastball that's over the plate uh, whereas here in triple a there's so many guys that pretty much on any given count can throw whatever pitch in their arsenal for a strike so it, it, it's a little bit more of an adjustment where where you have to uh you know you you have to you have to adjust to a new level of pitching and these are these are guys in triple a who uh, are talented and, and you know we talk all the time about this level being so special and that you, you get those prospects coming up for the first time but you also get the guys that have been in the majors and are trying to get get back up so you know ultimately I think you know for, for both Francisco and and for Brett uh, you just, they just need plate appearances in the majors still adjust we saw that with with Alvarez last year he struggled when he first got here and then by the end of the year he he you could tell he he gained a comfort level, and and you know an injury last year didn't didn't help either. Uh, this year, you know, he gets moved up a little bit quicker than I, mm -hmm. I think uh, some of the guys, you know, than than and, and, uh, maybe was the plan. But you know, he's someone who just has continued to uh, find ways to adjust, and I think uh, you know, despite any struggles early on, he'll he'll certainly find a way to to come around offensively because he's certainly one of the more talented guys we've seen. As far as Brett goes, I mean, I, I think his his talent from what I've seen, um, you know, when I was down in Fort Wayne, I got the opportunity to see uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. when he was 18 years old. And, and I think Tatis is probably the best minor league player I've ever seen in, in, in the minor leagues. It was, it was you could just tell that he was going to be something special. Uh, Brett is as close to that from what I've seen, um, you know, to, to, to the performance that Tatis gave 
you know, Brett's just a guy that hits the all parts of the field. And, and I think that, um, you know, again, you start to pick it up, had a couple of hits the other day. And uh, he's another guy that I think will continue to adjust defensively as well, uh, continue to do the things he needs to do. You know, I think it's clear that, you know, he's probably more ready uh, at this point, but I think both of them are going to be uh, very successful in a New York Mets jersey for a long time to come. So right now, the Syracuse Mets are 11 and 10 after a 7 6 uh, 10 inning loss to Durham yesterday. Ronnie Mauricio played second base again, continues to hit. His average uh, is at 350, drove in the 16th run. And I get moving Ronnie to a different position. Um, shortstop obviously is blocked here with Francisco Lindor. That's Ronnie's normal position. Uh, I understand second base, that gives you flexibility. McNeil could move to the outfield. But to me, Mauricio is so athletic. Um, do you think he's going to see any time as a corner outfielder in AAA? Because I, I see that being a real nice fit for him here. Yeah, I think if, if I recall, I think Buck the other day uh, mentioned that you, you you might end up seeing Ronnie, you know, not just at short, not just at second, but maybe uh, a little bit of first base and then maybe at the, the corner infielder spot. So he, he's a guy that before this season, he was asked uh, during our, our media day, um, you know, will, will you play other positions? Are you, are you willing to play other positions? And, and he flat out said, I'm going to play wherever, uh, whatever's going to get me up to the major leagues. That's where I'm going to play. So, yeah, I think you talk about his athletic ability and he's a guy just, that just has such great instincts. And when you can swing the bat, like Ronnie can, uh, a team's going to find a position for him. So, uh, you know, I, I think you can definitely expect to see him play at, at some, some other positions. And, um, you know, from, from what I've seen, he's, he's just, he just has that instinct where no matter where he plays, he's going to be able to, uh, to get to the ball and uh, really looking forward to seeing him add to that versatility. Cause I know that's what New York is looking forward to, uh, you know, having a guy who could swing the bat well from both sides of the plate, really good power from that left side. And, uh, you know, also be able to play all around the field as, as a utility guy. It's interesting because you, I, I wouldn't say they're carbon copies, but they kind of fall into that same category. If Batty is the third baseman of the future, that block, blocks Vientos. First base is Pete. If Mauricio also you know gets some time over there, where does Vientos fit into the puzzle? Will he be a, a corner outfielder guy as well? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he, he you know, main two positions that we've seen over the last couple of years are first and third. And I think you know, that right now is the plan to continue to, you know, uh, have another guy in terms to play both positions. You know, I talked to people last year and, and I agree that, you know, his, his bat is major league ready. <laughs> I don't think there's, there's any doubt about that. Uh, last year I was so impressed with, with his bat and this year just continue, continue to be impressed with the power that, that Mark brings, um, you know, again, sometimes if, you know, if a guy's hitting well, a team will find a position for them, uh, you know, and, and obviously for some of these guys, it's a little more complicated. And for Mark, you know, that, that may be one of, one of those cases, but it's a, it's a good problem to have. I think if, if you're the New York mass and you know, end up seeing what happens, uh, you know, now uh, for the second or doesn't get hit. Well, um, it, it, it's at least a possibility. And, and like I said, it's, it's a good problem to have. So I think the, the one constant theme with all of these guys and with, uh, you know, so many other players that we could even talk about here is that there's options. And anytime you have a winning club in the major leagues and you have options here in AAA, uh, you know, that's the key. And if all of these guys are starting to force force the, the hand in New York, then that's a good thing. It means they're doing, doing their job down here. It means the staff is doing their job and developing these guys. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you need to have guys ready here in AAA. And, and I think that's exactly what the New York Mets have. Michael, um, Khalil Lee, you know, member of the team, he was DFA, then he was back. He, uh, he has a court case that's ongoing in, in Syracuse. And I'm kind of wondering, has that been a distraction to the team at all? How, how have you guys dealt with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, there, there's not really a whole lot I can speak to that. Just I, I don't know all I can really say. Um, I don't think it's been a distraction. I know the New York Mets are kind of adhering to uh, Major League Baseball's investigation with all of that. And, and until more information comes out, that's all, that's all I can say. And that's all uh, I guess the Mets can say at this point with that. 
So the Mets have dipped down for pitchers, you know, uh, and for the most part, they've filled in adequately here. Joey Lucchese pitched an absolute gem. Jimmy Acabonis stepped in, in, you know, did stellar work in, in, the weirdest of circumstances, you know, having to fill in for Max Scherzer after he got thrown out. Jose Budo, who who looks like he's probably going to get the start. I don't think they've announced it yet. Uh, maybe you can let us know if he's on his way to New York uh, for tomorrow. Um, you know, but he also pitched well, but he did have um, the, the good fortune of having to pitch against the Oakland A's, who probably would be one of the lower teams in AAA right now. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe he'll get the Nationals tomorrow. Um, but there aren't a lot of young arms in that starting rotation down there. They've added Dylan Bundy, who really hasn't found his footing yet. Two starts, he's 0-1 with a 12-plus ERA. Are there any other arms down there that we could look forward to? You know, Because you know, pitching is going to be a need here. We've seen it early. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because uh, for the second straight season coming into the year during spring training, we thought we were going to have a starting rotation that was headlined by David Peterson and Tyler McGill. Uh, you know, last year injuries happened, things happened, and, you know, both of those guys were, were, up, were up in New York, and, and we only saw them at, at uh, sporadic points during the season. Second straight year, we think both David and Tyler are going to be here, uh, you know, when they had early injury with uh, Jose Quintana where Peterson goes up and then the, you know, or was ready to, to take the bus with us to, uh, to Worcester to open up our season. And, and then, uh, you know, the injury to, to Justin Verlander happens and, and he goes up. So, um, you know, right now, of course, you know, you, you have where, you know, the New York Mets were, were without uh, and are without four of their five starting pitchers, right. Now with the, with the, the suspension of Max Scherzer. So, Oh yeah, right now uh, here in Syracuse, you might not have a lot of options, but that's because all of those options are up in New York. I mean, I'm, I don't know how many other teams can lose four of their five starters in, you know, you know, Tyler McGill and okay, David, you know, Peters had struggled, but he's still a very talented pitcher. We saw what he did last year. And, and then you bring a guy like Joey Lucchese up and, uh, you know, I, I wasn't surprised at all considering what, what we saw his, his last start here in Syracuse against Scranton Wilkesbury and he looked he looked like it was was awesome performance for him and just like you know just an ultimate come you know I don't want to call this all right are, are you going to be as good as you were um you know so many guys do come back better but there's so many guys that don't so the fact that he's been able to come back and and when he pitched well in Scranton I'm going okay, New York's going to call this guy up pretty darn soon. He's going to fill a role and he's going to pitch really well. And he goes out and, and, and twirls the gem up, up there with, with New York. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where it's next man up. And uh, right now, maybe you got Jose Budo still, still that's currently on the, the active roster, but you know, you do add a guy in, uh, you know, let's say a, a Dylan Bundy, right. And uh, you know, he, he gives up a couple of home runs, but even his last start to swiping up four home runs, he gave, only four runs in five innings. He struck out nine. So, and I think there are a lot of from some of the guys that are here. And, and while they're not, while they might not currently be the youngest arms, it's because many of those guys are up there in New York. And I think that the New York Mets, while they've gone through some of those injuries, throw them positive uh, both for us here in Syracuse and, and obviously for New York moving forward. Michael, my last question is, um, I want to ask about Grant Hardwick. He's a uh, big pitcher for you guys. He's 6'5". I've tracked him a bit because he has a good strikeout ratio. He also is a pre-med guy. The Mets used to have Ron Taylor back when I was a little kid, who actually was a, uh, a med student, became a team doctor for the Blue Jays after winning world championships. So, you know, Hardwick has kind of gone down that road as far as being the doctor, but still playing ball. You know, what's he like? What, you know, what's his uh, future look like? Yeah, and I'm actually glad you, you brought him up because, um, because yeah, from a, from a guy in the bullpen who's who's still relatively young, I think he's someone who's got a really really good shot of being up in New York before the year. Fun story: we're we're on our way to Italy, like I said, and, and he actually went to uh, Catholic Central High School, which is in Metro Detroit. It's probably about 45 minutes away. It's just a little bit of a, a homecoming for Grant. My my broadcast partner Evan Stockton actually they they went to. Uh, to high school together so <laughs> they're both <laughs> excited to uh to get back home but yeah grant 
yeah, so so a, a fun little storyline there, but a little bit of a, a homecoming for Grant. And um, yeah, I mean, he's just been awesome. He's, he's only given up uh, two two earned runs all, all season long. And, uh, you know, he's, he's someone that this this team has relied on, the coaching staff has relied on. And, uh, you know, with 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 the mix of pitches that that I think he has to offer, uh, you know, his fastball really plays well. And and, uh, you know, I, like I said, I think you're going to see him in the majors before the, the season's done. And I think he's going to be he's going to be someone who uh, you might be able to rely on moving forward. And another bright arm uh, on the Syracuse uh, pitching staff that that can help New York at, at some point soon. It's interesting you mentioned that because last year, it might even be two years or, ago already, I mean, they had a guy like that in Jordan Yamamoto, who I thought was going to be able to help this team, and yet, you know, he never did. Um, are you kind of surprised at, at the trajectory that Jordan Yamamoto had in, in the Mets system? Yeah, it was tough. I think I think injuries really hurt. I know, um, I think going into, uh, I want to say it was last year, he was uh, he was going to be an arm. I think at the beginning of the year that was going to be in kind of our starting rotation and add some depth. And I think injuries hampered that because uh, I liked some of the stuff I saw two years ago from him. That just some of the innings he gave and was kind of looking forward to some of the rotation and the pitching staff we'd have here in Syracuse last year. And I, I think that was just a common theme last season was just injuries. And, and Jordan was uh, just one of those guys hampered by by that. Um, you know, because he had some experience in the, in the majors, he, he made a, I think a couple appearances with New York, but also with the uh, Miami Marlins, and it, you know, unfortunately, just never never panned out. It's, you know, that's that's that unknown, right? The injuries, you got to stay healthy. Yeah. It's 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 so difficult, and that's why you can never have enough arms. Uh, you know, and, and, and like we said, while while some of the arms here uh, are starting to dwindle, it's, it's still. Like I said, next man up. I mean, Jeff Brigham, right? He's another guy that was that was here in Syracuse. He goes up to New York, and, and he's he's I think uh, I mean he's he's pitched a couple of score, scoreless outings uh, with an elevated strikeout total. So just a, yep. another guy that that has really excelled in the majors that was here in Syracuse at one point. So lastly, I know you're on the team bus, you know, heading to Toledo. Um, so you take a look um, at the history uh, of even just Syracuse that you, you covered, you know, you got to see Tim Tebow, you, you mentioned Tatis, you know, junior, you got to see play. So in your minor leagues, what has been the most thrilling moment, uh, you know, the, the most exciting player to cover for you to date? Oh boy. Uh, man, that's a, it's a really good question. I mean, the, the, the Fort Wayne team, um, you know, back in, in, uh, that was 2008, uh, yeah, 2017, actually, at that point, uh, that was, you know, the interesting thing about that team was they were so young. And obviously, we're talking about a, a, a Padres affiliate on a, you know, podcast or a show about the New York Mets. But, um, you know, I think just well, the, the, the one thing I'll just point out about that team is the Padres signed so many international free agents. That was a team that had uh, a couple of guys that signed for, you know, one guy that signed for eight million dollars as an international free agent, another guy that signed for ten million dollars. If you added up just the uh, amount of money for the international free agent signees that were on that team, it was uh, more money than like four or five team payrolls. <laughs> so that was just an, an interesting fact about that that uh, you know Fort Wayne Tin Cap San Diego Padres single A affiliate back in, in 2017 you know again that was that was highlighted by uh, Tatis but uh, you know one of the more fun I guess uh, stretches here in Syracuse is back in uh, 2019 where uh, you know okay that team had Tim Tebow it also had guys like Rajay Davis and Carlos Gomez and Gregor Blanco and uh, at one point Matt Kemp was on the team for a couple of weeks so it was kind of a who's who I don't think you'll ever see a, a minor league team with that much major league experience ever again uh you know and, and that was a year where you thought maybe you'd, you know those guys would be not a whole lot of fun to be around because you know who want you know out of all those guys who have been in the majors for you know in some cases more than a decade do they really want to be in you know in triple a in Syracuse but that was actually the most fun year that I've had and the most fun group that I've been around and you know that that team was uh 10 games back at the all-star break and five games under 500 and ended up forcing a, a one game playoff at the end of the season, where unfortunately it was one of the more heartbreaking losses where they were up uh, at one point, eight, one in the seventh and 13 to six in the eighth and lost. <laughs> so uh, yeah, one, one of those unfortunate, I think gave up uh, six runs in the bottom of the seven scored six runs in the top of the eighth, and then gave up like seven or eight runs in the, 
bottom of the eighth. I've, I've never seen that before and <laughs> don't think I'll ever see it again. So it was, it was a heartbreaking end to what was a, a really fun season, unfortunately, but that was uh, definitely just in terms of the, the type of guys, the, uh, you know, the group we had there, it was, it was definitely uh, the most fun season I've had so far. And who knows, maybe, maybe this season well, with all the guys we have uh, could, could top it. We'll see. Awesome. We'd like to turn it over to the Zoom room. You know, a little sparse time. I'm sure they're watching the, the Ranger Devil game right now. Devils lead one nothing in the first period. Um, so, Steve or, or Sal, if you have any questions, uh, let us know. Syracuse Mets, either one of you guys. All right, Sal, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Mauricio. Now, I've been hearing about him for the last six years since they drafted him. He had a couple of down years year last year and the year before. Is he really putting it together, and how receptive is he to be in left field because he's not going to be playing short for at least six years? Yeah, no, it's it's a uh, it's a good question. I you know it's it's funny because uh, you know even in AAA, you know you obviously when you're part of the organization, you pay attention to some of the lower levels. And you know, last year you, I saw the, the year that Ronnie was having, but it almost seemed like some people were I don't want to say completely down on him, but maybe a little sour. Uh, and, 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 you know, during the off season, when I'm kind of looking at, okay, who's going to be in Syracuse this year, I'm looking at Ronnie, I'm going, wait a minute. Okay. He struck out a lot, but career high doubles, career high home runs, career high RBIs and, and a, a pretty darn good batting average. And, and it, it seemed like, you know, some of the prospect rankings had him dropped and people are saying, nah, I don't know, is he, is he really going to, you know, is he, is he really going to be, you know, the, the star that we thought he was going to be. And then he had that awesome uh, Dominican winter league run. Seems like, you know, if, if there was something he still needed to figure out, he certainly, he just carry that into the spring and he's carried it into, you know, this season so far, you know, we see a lot more power from the left side of the plate, but his batting average actually is a little bit higher from the right side of the plate. Maybe not with as much power, but, you know, he, he still, uh, I think, picked up. I think he finally grew into his so body. He's he still got some power. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And to to um, hit on the, you know, as you play other positions, like the field, he said he's going to play wherever he's going to be. So Gotta love spotty Wi-Fi on the road to Toledo, but uh, we, we got the gist of that. Uh, Steve, did you have a question? No, I right, actually oh, didn't. I, when I came on the call, Mike actually answered that, and and that is at least for me as an average fan. Uh, you know, again, as I mentioned last week, how we have. So much more information, almost too much information uh, as as a fan when it comes to the minor leagues uh, and, and wondering, you know, how you know these guys are going to be up and, and how are they going to make room for them? And it does seem like uh, a lot of them are now ready and, and you know, where does it go? And what do you do when it comes to contracts versus options and, and things like that? And maybe, uh, maybe talking about that, that aspect of it and how it, uh, how it, how it affects the team down there. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yes. Again, sorry about the, uh, <laughs> any of the right. spotty, spotty Wi-Fi here, but, uh, hopefully you get the gist of, of this answer. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, I, you know, AAA is always one of those areas where, uh, you know, you, you got some guys who are on the 40 man roster. You got some guys who aren't on the 40 man roster. And, and at the end of the day, there's always some, some shuffling. And, you know, I think maybe for the first time since I've been a part of the organization. So since 2019, I feel like there is quality depth at every single position. Like last year early, if, you know, fortunately Francisco Lindor didn't get hurt, but if, if he got hurt, for maybe like three or four weeks in uh, between like April and May, and even maybe into to June, honestly, I'm not sure there really was a good option in AAA to, to replace any of the middle infielders. This year, not only do you have, you know, okay, Ronnie Mauricio who's on the, on the 40 man, you have Danny Mendick. Now, this is a guy I don't think is getting, that is getting enough credit. Danny Mendick was hitting better than 300 for the Chicago White Sox last year. He was having an awesome season 
and then he tore his ACL. And, you know, he said he put in, he, he felt this, this uh, past off season, he worked as hard as he has worked and the results are showing. I mean, he picked up right where he left off. He said, like, I mean, you can argue has been one of our best, maybe our best, you know, besides Beatty and Mauricio, our best offensive weapons, so consistent. Uh, and, and he's a guy who plays really good defensively. He can, and, and he's somebody who not only can he play second, short, and third, but he has played both left field and right field. So he's already on the four major league experience and can play pretty much anywhere you need him. So, you know, uh, in terms of like shuffling roster spots and whatnot and dealing with options, um, you know, I just feel like this team in Syracuse is as ready in every position from starting pitching on down as, as any, uh, any team since, since I've been here. And I think that's a credit to, uh, you know, what the front office has done to really build a good contender and, and build that winning culture. Cause that was the other thing. I think, uh, something that really stood out to me when I talked to, to Danny Mendick earlier is, is, uh, you know, I asked him, well, what, in, what went into signing during the off season with the Mets? And he said, I wanted to win. I wanted to go to a winning organization. And, and he's not the only one I think that feels throughout baseball that the New York Mets are an organization that's committed to winning and is going to do everything it takes to win. And I think that cannot be, that can't be overstated just the perception that other players feel. And, and that can only help, you know, this year and moving forward when you're trying to build a, a winning organization where guys start to look and go, I'm going to take a closer look at that New York Mets organization. And that's how you build more depth when you get quality players wanting to play for you. You know, you mentioned Danny Mendick. I know he played the outfield the other night against uh, the Bulls. And, you know, Buck and I spoke about Danny a lot because I, I kind of saw him as uh, maybe a younger, more versatile uh, Luis Guillorme. But I, I asked, you know, Buck what he what, you know, Danny needed to do to make the team. And he said he's doing it. I, I was kind of surprised that he didn't make the team because he's also one of those great clubhouse guys. And, you know, I'm sure down at AAA, he's he's helping these young kids as a guy who's been there. Um, really good guy. And you're right. That, that's why he did sign. He said he, he wants to win. So before we let you go, the, the interesting thing is, is obviously you're on the team bus right now. And that's like a throwback when, when you know, the announcers would travel with the team. Um, how is that for you? I mean, you know, you're there with the players and, and you, you get to see them up close and personal and you, you get to really know their personalities. How does that help you for the broadcast? I mean, uh, it, it, you get to learn more about these guys. Um, you know, I always say one of the cooler parts of this job is, you know, literally one day you're riding the team bus next to a guy and the next day you're watching on, on SNY playing for New York at City Field. Like, it, it's it's one of those things that, um, you know, I think sometimes we as broadcasters have to remind ourselves just how cool this this job is and how lucky lucky we are. And, uh, you know, being able to travel with the team, you know, you, you get to know these guys a little bit more. You, you're part of the team. You know, like I said, the culture that's built, it's, it's just a really good group to be around. I think everyone I've talked to from the coaching staff on down to the, the support staff, the the guys in our uh, that, that deal with you know our equipment back in our home clubhouse, they all say it's just a great group of guys. And anytime you can kind of be embedded with that, you, you pick up on things here and there. And you have to have that level of trust, right? You you have to build that that level of trust with guys where you know they understand that you're you know you're you're not going to lie to people, but but you're at least going to to make sure that that uh, you know from my standpoint, I'm going to highlight people's you know put put their best foot forward and uh, being able to to you know be with these guys and yeah, you pick up a travel story or two on the bus and. And then you're, uh, you know, able to stand around the, the, the batting cage and, uh, you know, hear some stories here or there. It, it just uh, can only help the broadcast. And, uh, you know, again, it, it always helps when it's a good group of guys that, uh, that really welcome you with, you know, welcome me into the team. So it's nice. Last one before we let you go. Uh, not only the sport itself uh, is trending younger. You take a lot look around the league. There are a lot of young guys that are, you know, coming from AAA and manning the broadcast booth. Ultimate goal for you is that what it is? And you know, what what would be your dream job as a broadcaster? I mean, uh, you know, for me, eventually, I'd love to, you know, to work in a, a major league booth somewhere. I mean, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, with the, with the New York Mets booth someday or, uh, you know, whether it's a New York Yankees booth as well. You know, New York's just an awesome city. You know, I'd love to work for the Mets. It's been such a great organization. 
Um, but you know, at this point, sometimes uh, you know you got you got to take that 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 you know first major league job that comes your way because those major league opportunities don't don't come very often. So I'd love to work for a, a major league team, and and I'd also love to work for a network doing other sports too. You know, as much as I love baseball, and it's great during the you know spring and summer, and and uh, hopefully if your team's doing well into the fall and and into those October months, um, you know, I really enjoy and, and have been, uh, you know, happy to have the opportunity to do, you know, some football and basketball and lacrosse and some other sports during the, during the baseball off season. So, uh, you know, a couple of my predecessors, uh, you know, Jason Benetti, he's the Chicago White Sox television uh, voice and he's doing, doing, uh, you know, football and basketball for Fox sports and Kevin Brown was right after him. Those two work together. Kevin's the Baltimore Orioles television play-by-play voice and, and he does uh, work for ESPN. So kind of following that sort of path, doing some, some network stuff uh, when baseball is not in session and then, you know, working uh, hopefully eventually for a major league team somewhere, where, wherever the opportunity may come, that, that would be the ultimate goal. Awesome, Mike. We really appreciate your time tonight, especially on the team bus. Hope yep, to reach thanks, out to Mike. you during the season. Um, great, great stuff. All right. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Safe travels. And, uh, you know, yeah. really looking forward to a fun season. Thank you. Absolutely. Mike Tricarico, the voice of the Syracuse Mets. Good stuff out of him. Uh, we appreciate him on the road. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, <laughs> on the team, but amazing what, what technology does these days. Um, so, so, yeah. So good stuff out of Mike. So um, l- let's talk about the, the Mets now. Um, you know, we have a few minutes, uh, you know, Right now, it's uh, still one nothing. Um, Rangers are trailing the New Jersey Devils, in case you're interested. All right, it's the New York Mets. They played their 17th road game Sunday, most in the major leagues. Uh, the second closest in the league is Milwaukee and Philadelphia. They played 13 road games. Went 7-3 and three on a West Coast trip. Um, the most wins the Mets ever had on one road trip facing teams in California is eight. Um, the Mets actually went eight and one in August 18th um, and 27th in 1986 uh, versus the uh, Dodgers, the Giants and the Padres. Um, the Giants uh, stopped the Mets bid to match a feat they last accomplished in 2019. Going to last night's game, the Mets have recorded 10 or more hits in a season high four straight games. Last time the Mets recorded 10 or more hits in five straight was in 2019. Listen, seven and three, uh, one fifth of your starting rotation, basically. And, you know, you take Scherz's start out of that because he was gone before anything really happened in that game. Um, granted, you had the Oakland A's in there, but Dodgers and Giants, seven and three, I'll take that any day. Um, this team right now, still floored in, in, in some areas, not getting a lot of production from certain places, but yet, you know, uh, Braves just dropped a whole bunch of games. They're right there, half game, and you know, behind going into tonight's play. Big homestand coming up. Four games against Washington. Uh, four games against the Braves. Uh, you know, can't put too much emphasis on an April series, um, but you, you got to like you know this team again. It seems to me that no matter what obstacle is put in their way, somehow they overcome it. And the fact that. Yakabonis was able to settle things down in that game where Max got, you know, bumped uh, was huge for me. Um, even last night, um, ESPN's horrible announcing aside, like, you know, how can you, wait, I, I just got to get this off my chest. How can you make a mistake on the first batter of the game <laughs> and call him Michael Conforto rings one off the wall? Like, you don't know who's up it, but, and and the whole sticky stuff with David Cohn was just out of control. I, I, like, I want to uh, talk about that at some point. Yeah. So what, <laughs> Russ, let, let's start with that. Go ahead. Okay. I mean, look, I get it. They wanted to kind of show off a little bit of an experiment and they probably asked Cohn to make it as sticky as possible. So the ball would actually stick to his hand. That wasn't happening with Scherzer. Actually this whole thing with major league baseball is, is, has really been handled poorly. It's typical of Major League Baseball to implement rules and then not understand or have people who were supposed to enforce those rules don't understand them. So in other words, what I mean is none of these umpires have been schooled by any Major League pitchers on how they use rosin, what it feels like, how sticky it should be. All they're going by is, hey, this was stickier than last year, so this is bad. And I understand what Scherzer was saying because, A, He's using a substance that's legal in the game 
And it's kind of like Major League Baseball saying, hey, guys, don't chew tobacco, but here's free tobacco. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you can't you if you're going to do it right, you have to either tell a pitcher what he could administer uh, during a game, during an inning. Or you have to like employ a couple of pitchers, former pitchers, and go around and school these umpires and say, this is how they use it. This is how they shouldn't use it. This is an advantage. This isn't an advantage. And, and then if you want to work off the spin rates too during a game live, that's fine because if it's off the charts, I get it. They didn't do any of that. I don't understand why they chose alcohol to try and get this stuff off because like there's a product called Goo Gone. I don't know if you ever used it. It gets rid of everything sticky in your life. If, if you know anything, like if you got a price tag on something, you want to return it or give it as re gift it, use that stuff and nobody will ever know. <laughs> It'll but smell like just, gasoline. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but they don't, but Major League Baseball doesn't do anything right in these situations. What I felt bad for for Scherzer is not so much the two game suspension, but that's a win he would have had on his career. Like that's a win. I'm sure he would have won that game the way he was cruising, even after they took away his glove, which he was completely shocked. He looked like a kid on Christmas Eve morning, you taking away the, his favorite toy. Like he was like, you're my glove. What are you talking about? And so I don't think there was really any malice with Scherzer. And honestly, you kind of know when a player is lying, or at least I do. I've covered sports long enough. He didn't even hesitate when he spoke after the game. He was speaking the truth. And Major League Baseball not only handled it poorly, but since when are rules handled with them being the arbiter also how right. is that arbitration yeah. that there's nothing fair about that that's a kangaroo court man right and and i don't like the fact that you know uh, uh, listen i hate twitter to begin with but people saying like buck's got to get thrown out no buck doesn't isn't it what is buck he could have gotten out? mad though he should have gotten mad yeah. but you know what that's not out. but but you know what this is where this is why I think the Mets are able to overcome these obstacles. Yes, he could have got mad. He could have made a big thing. He could have got thrown out of I mean, that Davey game. Johnson would have gotten mad, right? We oh, know absolutely. <laughs> Davey Johnson, Wally Backman would have thrown out everything oh, in the dugout. Yeah. Right. But the thing is, Buck's demeanor is, okay, these things happen in a game. What are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think they're able to overcome a lot of these little minor bumps in the road. And you know what? For Max to get a suspension in April, and to come back with that fire, I think is, you know, and almost time perfectly to when JV comes in. Listen, I expect when the two of them get in together, I expect them to run off a whole bunch of wins. And, and I think, you know, I think Max is going to come back a little pissed off. And if you have a pissed off Max Scherzer, you know, I don't think there's a better pitcher in baseball sure. at that point. Now you're talking about when JV comes back and, and we're all waiting for that, right? That's a big thing. It's going to be like another opening day. Until then, though, I literally give Vogel back these next six games. And if he keeps swinging like a rusty gate, he's the guy who's gone in my eyes. Because you can't have all these guys rotating in and out of the DH spot no. and right. never actually get production out of the DH spot. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, with LeCastro on the DL, then even he clogs up the base bats. And here's another thing. This, this is what I was surprised at. Listen, I know Townley Fam has had a, a decent start to the season, okay? And people are going to kill me. All right, you know, thanks to Michael Conforto, you know, uh, you know, kind of got an RBI on that sacrifice fly. He drove in a run. He did his job fine. Um, however, you know, again, sometimes people look too much in analytics. I know Buck doesn't look at them that much either. But Eduardo Escobar has an extra base hit in seven consecutive games against the Giants. Only six players have ever had a longer streak in the history against the club. And overall, Escobar has hit safely in 10 straight games against San Francisco, going 18 for 40 with a 450 batting average and a, a 1.27 um, OPS. Listen, either one of those spots had to be for Escobar. If those yeah, are his numbers in I San Francisco, he, there's no reason he should have been on the bench. I, I get going to, you know, kind of early in that point. It, it worked. Um, but Escobar had to be in that game at some point for sure. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, and that's the thing, like the DH position is kind of made for Escobar at this point. Right. And, and, and now that baby is, is proving himself, I, I think definitely in the field, like, look, I didn't believe any of that nonsense when they were saying, well, he kind of needs to bone up in the field and to keep him down there. I was already reading about the great plays. He was, they were stalling and that's fine. <laughs> now that the stalling's over. Yeah. Let Escobar be the everyday DH. Let other guys go about their job. 
And once in a while, you could switch in that position. But it just, it's, it's, it's a typical Mets thing to actually get a DH and not be any good at it. Like, it's just, it's, it's crazy, right? But that's, okay. nobody is surprised by that, right? If anybody at the panel is surprised at that, just raise your hand, because I'm not. No, no. <laughs> no. And, and he's, and listen, as good as he looked in spring training, losing all that weight, it's back. Yeah, I mean, oh no, it's it, back. It, it, yeah, it, it's crazy. I, I mean, he did get himself in tremendous Look, he's shape. he's a good really guy. Good. We like him. Yeah, it's no, just, right. He's got an ugly swing. I don't care about his swing rate. I don't care about him walking. Because, again, you know, the one thing that's overrated about the Mets is they're the kings of OPS. I get it. But the problem is you still got to knock those guys in, and they're not the kings of that. Well, mm -hmm. the key is, listen, you know, it's great that, that you know, that um, Vogelback gets on base. Yes. But he can't run the bases. Right. That's So what problem. good is it? It's not like he's, right. you know, he's clogging up the base pass. You need to hit yeah. a triple and hope he makes it home. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's right. I mean – um, Sounds like me at fantasy camp. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, you know the other thing is you take a look at Pete and, and the season he's putting together right now. Um, it, it, unbelievable! He's the first uh, become the first player in Met history ten home runs before May first. Uh, he's got twenty two RBIs this month. Uh, he had one RBI in March as well. The franchise record for RBIs in the month of April uh, is twenty six by Jeff Kent. So he's he's four off that pace. He's got a week to go. Uh, it's one killing grade. me because uh, on the cover of my book, you know, numbers don't lie, is the 252 homers with with Daryl Strawberry, and that's in jeopardy now. <laughs> Not yet, but soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting too. I mean, they did speak to to Pete uh, about that pace, and that pace would put him on 73 home runs for the season. And, and <laughs> being in San Francisco, <laughs> they talked to him about Bonds, and he just said that's just sick. He can't even fathom how that happened. And, and well, it's we interesting know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, yo, I know that, but it's interesting that Pete said that he's like, um, he looks at old videos uh, of Bonds and some of the guys because he just loves looking at unbelievable swings. It's one of his things, he said. So he does go on YouTube and check that out, but he was just blown away. Um, Lindor also, I think, uh, has now reached safely 15 of the last 17 games. Average hasn't shown it yet. I mean, it, it's climbed, but this it's still last year, too, though. Like he was productive, right. but it, I'm not worried about him. No, oh, me either. Uh, again, you're right. The the DH spot, the fact that either – listen, uh, you know, I, I know they put Tommy Pham in the outfield. He's not an outfielder. He He's lost two to three steps. Vogelback, the, the two real – you know, in a game that craves versatility these days, they there's no versatility in those two. So you're right. I, I, I do like the fact that Escobar, you know, switch hitter, you know, can give you a bunch of bats at the DH yeah. and you can spell Batty at third base. Yeah. Um, Batty could be DH. To, listen, I also love the fact that they finally made that move with Mauricio. I, I think he'll be here. The one thing that I, I don't am know why they're about, playing him at second, though. I mean, they right. really should be playing him in the outfield. In the outfield. Really yep. I agree. I agree. Um, but here's the one thing I really get a little bit nervous of. Um, if the White Sox continue um, to play this poorly um, and Liam Hendricks comes back and, and you know, from the can and, and pitches lights yeah. out, you know, they do have another starting pitcher who's been good, who's not doing well right now. Um, I'd hate to see the Mets trade some of their youth for a quick fix. Granted, you know, your window is, is closing. Uh, it's hard to say when you have well, young this window is closing. They're trying right. to. Yeah, right. 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 So like, yeah, it, it's a really difficult position for Billy Epler to be in. I mean, well, here, here's be something I'll tell you that yeah. I, I like Vientos, right? I've, I've actually been following him for a while, but I ran into a scout uh, and he, he told me a lot about Vientos. And while I do love his power, his swing and miss rate is still bad. Like it's, it's not great. And it's going to take probably another year or two of waiting for him to get to whatever level he's going to get at. So if I have to trade one of the prospects to get a guy like Hendricks, assuming he's healthy, he's the guy I'm going to trade because Mauricio's already there and he's starting to get better and everybody else is with the Mets. So <laughs> that's the guy who I'm, who I'm trading and, and I'm okay with it. Even if he goes out and he hits 20 homers for the next five years, they're going to need this closer because they're killing Drew Smith. 
They're killing him. He's gonna he's he's gonna be in way too many games this year. And, right. and that's something that we all kind of knew with the older 40-something-year-old pitchers, or at least I'll tell you what my philosophy was. These guys are going to miss games. They're going to have to manage them. They're going to have to really manage it in September. I knew that kind of Senga was going to almost be their ace simply because he's the younger guy and he's probably not going to miss many starts, right? And even though he's not been perfect, he's 3-0. and So that part's checking out. But the bullpen, it's not going to hold up all year. So you're right. If they can make it – and if they can acquire a guy like that, they have to do it. Well, I mean, they have two starters there that are, are struggling right now in Kopech and um, Lanslin. Yeah. Um, do I want them? Listen, I, I put a poll up. And for me, it's a no-brainer. I know he's terrible. I know he's been terrible for five years. But if you can get him at the, the major league minimum, put him down in Syracuse, let him have four or five starts, see if you can fix him. Uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Madison. You know what? If you put no, I Madison, wouldn't touch him. I wouldn't. But let me ask you a question: If you put Madison Bumgarner with Scherzer and Verlander, okay, those guys are you know, they're just professors of pitching. If there's yeah, yeah, something, you got to put them in bubble wrap because Bumgarner. Here's here's the problem: the other two will definitely be there. I'm not worried about that, right? Because they don't get hurt for long. They end up taking themselves out. They get it. Bumgarner's had a complete loss of velocity for the last two years. That's my issue with Bumgarner. No, I agree. But for me, you know, a team that's flush with cash and doesn't really care. Yeah. If you get this guy at the, you know, listen, uh, it, listen, I get he's got tons of baggage, but you know what? Sign Matt Harvey to minor league contract. Get him down. No, there. no. He, <laughs> I, listen, I know. I know you have a soft spot for him. I no, watch, I don't. I, I Listen, I just want arms. I, we're I gonna watch need his arms. videos. I watch his videos. And on a video, a 91 mile an hour per hour fastball looks pretty impressive. It doesn't when all of a sudden you're in a in a high leverage situation in a game. All of a sudden you wish that guy was throwing 95, 96. Oh, absolutely. Movement. He doesn't have movement anymore either. He uh well, it's hard to tell. And a okay. side session is hard to tell. His his movement was pretty decent, and, and there were a couple of scouts there, but obviously no one no one Not even good enough for sniff it. Right. Yeah. And and that was after the world, you know, baseball classic where listen, a team Israel guy got signed by the Mets. You yeah. know, Bubby's down in triple. We didn't yeah, even Bobby, speak listen, to him about Bubby. Everybody should sign to. a guy named Bubby. Right. I'm partial um, to that. I get right. It. So, so I get, but like you are going to, you know, you take a look at that Syracuse staff. Granted, most of them have been elevated here, yeah. but you do need, we're going to need another arm. And, you know, it's going to have to come via trade. And I don't know who you're going to have to give up. That's the problem. Well, I, I don't look. The good thing for them is they need a four or a five. They're right. not that expensive. They got one, two, and three locked up. And even if they don't right. have one, two, and three locked up, you know, McGill can play the part of a third. So you really, you kind of got to get a four or five. And so maybe, and, and again, this hasn't worked out great for them in the past, but maybe that four or five is going to be one of those older guys too, where he's like somewhere between 35 and 38 and, and he's got an expiring contract. You know, like I'll give you an example. I'll just throw out a name. I have no idea what his contract status is, but like Zach Davies, a lot of times looks like he can get through a season. Sometimes he gets hurt. You know, it's somebody like that. If he's healthy, at the trade deadline, you bite at it because he's got good major league experience, can make a lot of starts, or at least conceivably. That's what they have to look for. I don't think they have to shoot for the moon there. Right. And listen, I mean, I think the guy that might go, you might trade one disappointment for another. And right now you have to say David Peterson is a disappointment. And he's I don't got think this he's, opportunity. He, uh, I'm going to disagree. He's Is he walking a few too many and giving up runs? Sure. His strikeout ratio is still really good. And he is still being able to get innings in. I still think there's something there. I, I'm i willing to wait a little longer on Peterson than I think others are. I think the Mets are, too, because they're really in a bind for a lefty right. anyhow, so they don't really have a choice. Yeah. Uh, I think he's going he's gonna to pull it out, though. I do. I don't think his starts have been that bad. I don't. His last two have been a little concerning. He's been getting yeah, hit have. pretty hard. But I agree with you. Lefties seem to figure it out much later. And they, you know, then they end up having careers like Oliver Perez. Who's, I mean, look, you know, he, he keeps pitching every game. You know, Matt, right. as much as we love Steven Matz, he never stayed healthy. Right. Right. Agreed. All right. Um, it's pretty much a the wrap Nationals, on tonight. they got to win two out of three against the Nationals. Like, that's a guarantee. I'm looking at these Three out of four. Matchups. Yeah, three out oh, of yeah. four. They play three out of four. Sorry, it's four and four. Yeah, they definitely. But they, what you look at the pitching matchup is TBD, TBD, TBD. No, 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 no. Not the first one. They have they have somebody going the first one.
But what I'm a little worried about is game one against the Braves is Peterson. Like that's a tough one, man. That's that's probably his his toughest game of the year right there. That's yeah, and hopefully he rises to the occasion. I mean, it's it, that's the problem with him. You know, he shows you these flashes of what yeah. he can be yeah. when you least expect it. Like that brave game, you expect him to get lit up, and he'll go out and probably pitch a gem. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting. It, you know, I agree. You need three or four because right now, and listen, they they are no um, walk in the park, the Marlins either. So I think the the Braves play the Marlins first, right? I think the play the Marlins uh, and they come look. to us. Pretty look. sure. Uh, hold on, two days now. It's Max it, Freed, I think, in that first game for the Braves, right? Yeah, yeah and they have Kyle yeah. Wright going. Mm-hmm. He's going against yeah. Bar- uh, Garrett at least, but I mean, the Mar the Marlins could win one game. I don't know if they're going to win more than one right. game. Right. So it's interesting that both should come in on a, you know, a winning note, the two of them. And then luckily the Mets head out to Detroit. So um, that's not bad. You know, they can. No, no, you know, Detroit can't pitch. So that's good. But, right. but the, you know, my worry is, and this is every Met fans worry. You look at the Mets, you look at the Braves. The Braves has done everything right. They've locked up all the right guys. They've got a lot of positions covered. They even have an embarrassment at some of them. They're right there. Like, we're all still expecting the Braves to win the division and the Mets to just get one of the wild cards. I mean, that's still the way it's kind of set up here. And that's why, like what you said, when you said Hendricks, it's kind of like, it does have to be something that drastic for the Mets to actually have the edge on the Braves. Cause right now they don't, even if Verlander and Scherzer are back in full force, they still don't. It's closer, but they don't. Right. And I agree. They they need to clean up that DH position uh, yeah. as well. So it, it's going to be interesting. And we're going to be here each week talking about it. And that's what the fun part about it is. Appreciate, you know, the two stalwarts. Listen, uh, I think Steve now takes over the Cal Ripken streak as uh, no Mike, <laughs> Mike Tuller tonight. A little late, and, but yeah. And, and I don't think Tuller is a big uh, Ranger fan either. So we don't know. We'll have to give him some grief. Uh, all right. We'll see everyone next week. And as always, let's go Mets. Have a great one, guys. All right, Rosie. Be Thanks. good. Take care, guys. Right, good night, guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye. See you.